Well, we continue our series in the seven letters to the seven churches of Asia Minor, what we would call Turkey today. We've come to the third of these seven letters, the letter to the church at Pergamos, or sometimes it's said Pergamum. It's the same place. It's the most northerly of the seven letters to the churches. It's not far from the coast. You can go there today. It has a slightly different name. Pergamos was a bit like Washington, D.C. It was the provincial capital of the area of that whole district. It was famed for a very large library. There were 200,000 books or scrolls in that library. And it was also famous for having not one, not two, not three, but four temples. The most famous was the Temple of Zeus, but there were three other temples as well. And there was much worship done there to Zeus and the three other false gods, but they also worshipped the emperor that changed from time to time. It was an immense place of idolatry, and the enormous altar to Zeus dominated the town, and so it was a place of much irreligion, we might say. The most religious of the seven uh, churches in that area and a place of a great deal of idolatry. And we shall see the evidence of that. The first letter that we considered was the letter to the church at Ephesus. It reminded us of loveless orthodoxy, religion that's on the outside, with no heart, no love, no real compassion. And the church at Ephesus was challenged about that. The church at Smyrna, They were told that they needed to be faithful under trial. They had many trials. But the key issue here when we come to Pergamos is the need to avoid cultural compromise. And if any of the seven letters are relevant today, which I believe they all are, this one especially, as we shall see the great temptations that the believers came under there, avoiding Cultural compromise, that's our title tonight, in all its varying guises. It's a letter that teaches us the need to be watchful, as we've just sung in our hymn, the need to be on our guard, watching. It's when we're not watching, when we're half asleep, that we might be tempted into things that we should not. And so we come to this letter We commence as we have. It's got the same formula, the same pattern as all the other letters. And it starts to the angel of the church in Pergamos. It's a letter written to the pastor. Why him? Well, it's clearly to all the church members, those who had committed themselves to that family in that specific local church. But particularly... The pastor had a responsibility to guard, to watch. And if he didn't guard the pastor there, well, he would bear the responsibility for those that went astray. If he wasn't watching, if he wasn't guarding to the angel of the church at Pergamos, what was the great danger? Deceit, lies. Satan really does one of two things. He will either lie to you or he will seduce you. One is dealing with the truth and twisting it. One is making things seem appealing that really are not and we should have nothing to do with. Well, we notice then that Zeus's altar dominates this town. If we look down and we'll go through the verses, look at verse 13 where Satan's seat is. Now there was four temples and there was also a building dedicated to worshipping the emperor. It was the seat of emperor worship. So we're not sure which one it is, but it seems like the Lord Jesus Christ who wrote this letter through John is saying, this city is where Satan has his authority. A seat is where a ruler 
rules from. It's where Satan has his seat. It's a symbolic reference. They would have been acquainted with that symbolism. The place where a ruler would rule from is the seat or the throne. Well, where does Satan rule from in our lives if we let him? He rules from the mind and the heart. He comes and tells us these lies. He comes and seduces us with things that sound appealing or okay. And it's a terrible thing. Because when the mind becomes carnal, Christ will not rule. To be carnally minded is death. Romans 8, 6. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. Well, these people, as we jump to the core, before we come back and go through the verses, these people were becoming carnal. It's as simple as that. They were taking down the boundaries, the distinctions that set them apart, which were so clearly the Lord's ways, and they were compromising with the culture. It was a wicked culture that they lived in, but they were beginning to compromise. That's the gist of this letter. Well, let's go down and look particularly at the words here. So we've said, verse 12, it's addressed to the pastor. But then Christ, as he does in all the letters, he says a description of himself that's really relevant to the core problem. He repeats what it says in chapter 1 and verse 16. As he's introduced, who's the one that writes the letters? Christ, verse 16, he says, Christ had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. Now, I don't think we're supposed to think of Christ with a sword literally coming out of his mouth. This is revelation, it's symbolic. But the same figure is used in verse 12 of chapter 2, and this is really relevant these things saith he, which hath the sharp sword with two edges. What's the sword? The sword is always God's word. God's word is described in many ways, but one of them is as sharp as a two-edged sword that pierces the heart. The word of God has authority. You either accept it or you reject it. Somebody was saying to me today that I was visiting. It's interesting. The first verse of the Bible. There's no introduction to God. There's no explaining the logic of where he comes from. In the beginning, God. What authority? I am here. This is me. This is my word. It's very significant. And here comes the sharp sword with two edges. What does that speak of? Authority. Just contrast that with Satan's seat. The seat is the authority. So we have this contrast between the two-edged sword, God's authority that pierces and cuts the heart, a sword which speaks of justice and of ruling and of judgment and of God's ultimate authority. You might think, the gods of Pergamos, this is as though the letter's saying this, have authority. They can tell you what to do and how to live, but no, the real authority is with God and with his word and his two-edged sword. And one day, these false gods and Satan, he will be taken down. Of course, the victory has already been had. Christ has defeated Satan and one day Satan will finally be put down. You see, this is the issue, carnality. Where's the authority? When we listen to Satan, to his lies, to his seductive sounds and messages like those Greek gods, the siren voices, we're saying he has authority over us and over our lives. And the Lord Jesus Christ is saying to the church at Pergamos, I have the authority. 
I have the sharp two-edged sword. This is Christ just describing himself. He's saying that really all carnal thinking, which is so foolish, so passing, so temporary, needs to be put to one side. Our authority is the word of God. He's telling us the natural mind, even as believers, desires a comfortable life. It desires to compromise just a little, to let the boundaries creep, to sail as close to the wind as we can. And that's what Satan says. Live it easy. Be comfortable. No pressure. Seek popularity. Put your name out there. Be heard. Be seen. But these are not words that come from Christ and his word. They come from the throne room of Satan. This letter is telling us, well, before we get to the sharp words, there is a commendation. So as as it is in all of the letters, verse 13, I know thy works. He speaks with knowledge. He knows this church. He knows all the churches. Chapter 1. The Holy Spirit moves between the candlesticks. He knows each church. He knows us intimately. He knows our weaknesses. He knows the things that we're okay at. But he gives a commendation. I know your deeds and words. And I know your context. Verse 13. Where you dwell. I know what it's like living in Bedford. Says the Lord using application. I know the problems of this town. I know the difficulties when you go and witness. I know how challenging it is in your place of work. I know your works and where you dwell and your context. I know the challenges in the family circle, even where Satan's seat is, ruling in so many lives. And he commends them, he says, You are holding first, fast to my name. Well, that means a lot more than just his name, his honour, his reputation. You are seeking to live for Jesus Christ, he says, for my name. And secondly, you've not denied the faith. I'm sure he's speaking to the faithful believers because there's some there who are not. It's a slightly mixed congregation and membership. And he says, you've hold fast, you've been firm, you've stood your ground. You've not compromised on six-day creation. You've not compromised on your worship. You've not compromised on the authority of God's word. You've held firm, that's good. And you've not denied my Faith, it's not your faith. It's not a lovely term. My faith, we guard the faith of Christ. And then he goes on, even in those days where in Antipas, this is the only mention of this man in the whole of Scripture. We don't know so much about him other than he was evidently a faithful man. Legend or tradition, if we can call it that, suggests that he was the pastor of this church. We don't know that. Evidently, he would not give in. This is what's said by tradition. He was told, Antipas was told by one of his tormentors, Antipas, the whole world is against you. And famously, if it's true, he said, it sounds good, he said, then I am against the whole world. If the world is against me, I'm against the whole world. That's the sort of thing a faithful martyr would say. It's what some of those that died in the Reformation, written in Fox's Book of Martyrs, it's what they would have said. They would have said such things. The whole world is against you, Antipas. Then I am against the whole world. And he was slain. Just imagine for a minute. If one of our number was killed next week for the faith, what would it do to us as a congregation, as a church? Would it not strengthen our faith? 
And the Lord says you held fast. You didn't deny the faith even in those days. It seems to be suggesting looking back in time. I don't know how many years ago. Let's imagine it was a decade or more. But now the memory is fading. Antipas may be your pastor. He died as my faithful martyr. He was slain among you. The suggestion is it was in one of their meetings or somewhere closely connected to them. Where Satan dwelleth, it says it again. It says, I know where you dwell. And this man Antipas was martyred where you dwell, the same place, in Pergamos. Oh, how sobering. What a cost for the faith. We got it so easy. Sometimes don't know what to pray for, do we? Maybe we should pray that <coughs> chastening, persecuting times will come. Because in Pergamos's case, when the memory begins to fade, when it was even back in those days that Antipas was the faithful martyr, things have slipped, compromises seem to have come in to this church that was once faithful. So here we come, verse 14. We've had Christ's self-designation. We've had his commendation for their faithfulness, particularly a few years before. And verse 14, but. Oh, always a pivot with that word, but. But. I have a few things against thee. How balanced it is. Remember the encouragement comes first. That's a lesson in parenting. That's a lesson in personal discipleship. Always the encouragement comes first. Make sure you find good things before you give the challenge. Preferably more good things. Verse 14. But I have a few things against thee because... Thou hast there them. It seems like there's a division. They're mostly faithful, but there's the them. Some who were not holding fast anymore. Some who were denying the faith. Some who were compromising. We shall see how. There are those there, them, that hold the doctrine of Balaam. Well, this takes us back to the book of Numbers. We haven't got time to look at it in detail tonight. It's recorded in Numbers 22, 23 and 24. There was this man, a prophet, who offered money to curse Israel. And he was unsuccessful in what he wanted. Instead of Israel being cursed... The one who was sent to curse them, his mouth opened and out came four blessings. It really annoyed him. Balak, the king of Moab, who had hired Balaam, the man you remember with the talking donkey, he was very angry. What a dilemma he faced. He desperately wanted Balak's goodwill because he craved the money that had been offered him if he would curse Israel. But his love of money overpowered his morals. If he had to sacrifice his morals over God's people to obtain it, he was willing to. And so he hatched a plan, it seems. The plan was later to cost his life. He advised Balak to put on a great religious party and he invites the Israelites to join in. And at the party, this is the relevant bit, at the party there was wonderful food displayed, put out before all the people. But it was food that had previously been offered and sacrificed to idols. Food that they were not to eat. Food that they knew the Lord hated. And then to make it worse, Pagan, heathen, godless women were instructed to entice the men of Israel 
to do things they should not do. So we read in verse 14, chapter 2, Revelation, the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit sexual immorality. And this would bring down the wrath of God upon the Israelites. And the blessing that had been pronounced would be nullified. And the mission which he was hired to achieve would not be achieved. And Balaam was unfaithful to God. Outwardly it seemed like he was faithful. Four uh, phrases, four episodes of blessing came from his mouth. It seemed on the outside he was doing God's will speaking the words that God gave him, but secretly in his heart. He was causing God's people to stumble because of his love of money and of immorality. Well, we're going to apply this later. It goes on in verse 15. So hast thou them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Well, we've come across that in the church, the letter to the church of Ephesus. Look what it says. These things are put together, the doctrine of Balaam and the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Do you know the Christian life is simple in one way? We're to love the things that God loves and hate the things that he hates. And God would not have anything to do with idolatry. He wouldn't have us to bow down in our homes to anything akin to an idol. Even a second degree, something offered to an idol. And anything that's outside of the God-ordained, God-commissioned, planned for intimacy. Oh, he says, I hate these things. This is God's way. There is to be purity. There is to be one God. No other gods. Anything that we put before God is an idol. Anything that competes with God for our time and our attention is an idol. And anything outside of God's ordained plan for our bodies is something which he hates. What they were doing, the Nicolaitans, just to remind you, as they were introducing a hierarchy into the clergy and so that they could put their ego to the fore and they could put themselves up, up, up and have this grand structure amongst the clergy and then they could conquer the people and they could extract money from the people. But you know the same things go on today in a different form. People in the name of religion and Christianity, they get people to pay for information about God. They get people to pay to get their sins forgiven. That's no different to idol worship. If you give me this, then I will take that away. We can't do that. What about counselling in churches? There's a big trend in America where if you want to have counselling, and there's nothing wrong with that, biblical, Bible-based counselling, and the churches are charging for therapy to believers, to those in need, men of God. It's no different to what's going on here, seeking to extract personal gain and money in the cause of a so-called gospel to manipulate and to use worldly methods. Oh, that's not the way of God. We put our confidence in God, not in man. We put our trust in his word and his authority, not gimmicks and games. We must be so careful to do God's work God's way under his holy rules and his God-given directions. To hate the things that he hates. If he says, I hate something, God detests it. And Christ is saying here, 
These practices have creeped into the church. You're to have nothing to do with it. It's compromise. Those believers at Pergamos, not all of them, but those who've gone astray, who've allowed the temple worship and the methods. There was one of the temples at Pergamos where supposedly was healing could be done. And many of those that had disabilities and perhaps they were invalid, as we might have called it once, they would be carried along and there they would have to pay great sums of money. And there was much jiggery-pokery done, no different to what goes on in some churches today. Money and promises offered. And these are the sorts of practices following the doctrine of Balaam and the Nicolaitans. Well, let's come to the promise. Verse 16. There's a promise given after the plea. The plea is a simple one. We've seen it before. Repent. Turn from your wicked ways. Turn away from the things that I hate in all its forms and guises, depending upon the generation that Satan is so subtle. He uses a slightly different method in each time and each era, but fundamentally it's the same, undermining the authority of the word of God, lying and then seduction, saying that you can live according to his rules. So he says, repent. And then there's a warning. Or else I come and I come quickly and I will fight against them. Notice what it says, with the sword of my mouth, that two-edged sword again. This time it will come in judgment and it will remove those. The Lord will come down in judgment and he will purify his church. Remember, judgment begins first at the house of God. The Lord would have his church to be pure and he will come and fight against his own supposed believers. Maybe they weren't or maybe they had slidden backwards with the sword of my mouth. And verse 17, there's a lot here and this is where we will focus in the time that we have left. Verse 17 he that has an ear, if you want to obey, you've got to have an ear to what God says. You've got to hear him. And this is the Spirit speaking. The Spirit speaks individually to the churches and to this church, particularly at Pergamos and to us. Here's the promise to him that overcometh. And there's a very curious set of terms here. This church, if you're faithful... If you do repent, if you turn from any compromise and you overcome the wicked one and the seat of Satan, you will be given something curious, the hidden manna. Well, we know what the manna was in the Old Testament. It was what fed them physically. It was seen. But this is different. This is spiritual manna, which you can't see physically. It's God's word again. It's a reference back to what God will feed them with. His word, his truth. I will feed you. You won't see it, but the hidden manna will be provided every day, frequently. A double portion for the Lord's day. And you'll also be given something else. You'll be given this white stone. Now this is very curious. There's at least five different explanations. They're all interesting and I think they're all helpful. What on earth is the white stone that's mentioned here? First of all, it could have been a white stone was given in the Greek judicial system to those who had been acquitted. They were either given a black stone or a white stone. And it was handed only to them once they'd been tried and the judgment came. If you got a white stone, you were free. You were not guilty. If you got the black stone, you were sentenced. Well, what does this mean if that's true? I think the pictures are all very helpful. If they are promised a white stone, it means their guilt has been taken away. 
They're no longer guilty. What's that? That's justification. Our guilt has been removed. And by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we're given a white stone. Not guilty. My sin has been taken away by Christ. And a new name has been written. We'll come back to that in a minute. We're new creatures. <coughs> we have sinned. But Christ now lives within us. And so our sin record has been taken away because there's no sin in him. The old me is no longer alive. It's been replaced by Christ. I'm given the white stone. That's the first picture. The second, the white stone apparently was given in elections. The black stone indicated no. The white stone indicated yes. You have been chosen. Well, that has obvious meaning too. If we're promised a white stone, it reminds us that we're chosen before the foundation of the earth, chosen in Christ. And Christ gives us the white stone. We didn't deserve it. We didn't choose him. He chose us. And because he chose us, we are secure in Christ. Well, I think that would be true. Thirdly, a white stone, apparently it was given to the victor in a race. A garland, maybe, a wreath for the victor, but also the one that won was given the white stone. And that entitled them, apparently, to go to the victor's banquet. All the victors of all the races and all the battles would go to a banquet and you had to show the white stone before you entered. Well, that's an obvious application. We're victors in Christ <coughs> and we will go to that great banquet, to the banqueting house where the banner over me is love. That would be true. Fourthly, <coughs> The white stone was handed to a guest. A guest as a sign of welcome. If you went into a wealthy person's house, you were given a white stone and that meant you had the whole run of the house, so to speak. You were treated as though anything was yours. You could live in that house and have free course a white stone indicated that everything was yours. Well, that's true of the Christian as well, isn't it? We're given all the riches in Christ Jesus through the Holy Spirit. And then there's a fifth thing. We finish with this. White stones were given for allotting an inheritance. If you were given an inheritance, a white stone spoke of an inheritance that was incorruptible, that faded not away, it didn't perish, 1 Peter 1, 4. But notice here it says, they will give him a white stone, and in the stone was a new name written. Not your name. This name was different. A name which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. You see the picture, you're given a white stone, you've been given an inheritance. What's that name? It's Christ's name, written on the white stone. And the only person that knows what it is, is the one that receives it, that knows Christ and comes into relationship with him. The word name or anoma in the Greek covers everything that that person is, the character, the power the excellence, the rank, the majesty. So what does it mean if that's the explanation? It means you're given a white stone, purity. Your sin has been washed away. And on that stone is written the name of Christ. Nobody else knows. Just you who've been given that white stone and every other believer. And you receive it. And it's got your new identity, Christ, who's going to live within you and all his characteristics are going to grow within you what does the apostle paul say ye have not so learned 
Christ. And so when we have that new white stone and the name written on it, we take on Christ's character, Christ's purity. What's the relevance of that to Satan's seat and to these four temples of worship? It's very clear. A white stone, purity, the name of Christ, his character. We're not to be like Satan's seat. We're to be like the sword with two edges that's sharp and powerful and that gives us our instructions. This is the letter to Pergamos, a letter so relevant to us today. It challenges the way we live. What compromises might we be subject to today? Undermining the word of God, yes. These so-called logical fallacies, which are the common thing, you often hear it, they go something like this. Discrimination is wrong. And we say, yes, we agree with that. Men and women are therefore equal. Well, yes, they are to an extent. Men and women are therefore the same. No, not true. And yet this is the sort of logical fallacy arguments which are put before us. Marriage is good. Tick. Anyone should be able to marry. No. It's not what God's word says. Marriage is only for a man and a woman that love each other and that covenant to each other and that it, where it's legally recognised. Maybe one more example. What about the doctrine of sin? There's a great trend at the moment in some well-known churches that says there's no such wrong in same-sex attraction. To be tempted is not to sin. That's not what the Word of God says. You see, what they're doing is minimising sin to just the deed, just the action, rather than the desire and the lust. And Augustine, who was the great early church father that defined what sin is, he said, sin comes from the heart. It's what comes out of a man which is impure. Not what the person does. What we do is motivated by what we are and by what we desire. We have to be so careful to go back to the word of God. Well, may the Lord help us to avoid the very many cultural compromises in the work, at home and here in this church. Yes, we want to move with the times, use technology in the astonishing ways in which it is being used today. But we don't compromise on the word of God. That does not change. The issues of the heart have never changed. And we turn people to Christ. We point them to him, the one who is the white stone, whose name is written upon it. And we are to know only him. Let's sing our closing hymn. Hymn number 699. Another hymn of conflict. And the Lord's help and prayer for help in the midst of the conflict. Just at the end, if anybody involved in stewarding, if we could come together afterwards, shortly after the meeting, that would be very helpful. 699. In the hour of trial, Jesus, pray for me, lest by base denial I depart from thee. 699.